Okay, so the first lecture, so actually the first three lectures or four lectures will be about macroeconomics. That is um, the study of uh, questions like that, that concern society as a whole, like unemployment, uh, growth, the GDP, inflation, etc. So big aggregate variables. And uh, I'm starting this first lesson by talking about uh, John Menard Keynes. Um, who didn't have um, the Nobel Prize because uh, he died uh, too early to, to, to get one. The, the first, uh, yeah, because Nobel Prizes are only awarded to living people. And uh, the first Nobel Prize in economics, which is not a real Nobel Prize, actually, it's, uh, it's uh, delivered by the, the Swedish Central Bank. Uh, they, they wanted to, to promote the economic science somehow. And they created this prize in 1969. But uh, John Miller Keynes would have uh, uh, for sure uh, gotten one uh, if he had lived uh, longer uh, because he's uh, arguably the, the most important economist of the, the 20th century. And uh, macroeconomics after Keynes uh, had developed um, from, uh, so either to continue his idea or in opposition to his ideas. So I have to present uh, his ideas before I jump to the, the Nobel Prizes in macro. So uh, he was a powerful intellectual. So um, yes, he, he came from the, the British upper class. Uh, his, his dad was also a professor uh, in epistemology. And um, he was um, an academic at uh, Cambridge University, uh, also worked for the English Treasury, and uh, became famous right after the First World War where he, his book, uh, The Economic Consequences of Peace became a bestseller. Uh, where, so because he was a negotiator for the UK at the Versailles Treaty that uh, ended the, the First World War. And he heavily criticized uh, this treaty for endangering the stability of Europe. He foresees, uh, he foresaw in this book that a war could emerge 20 years later. Uh, because uh, what the allied power demanded to Germany was unfair and uh, would uh, put uh, the German economy uh, underwater, and, um, and this would create the misery and, and instability. He, he called for um, some kind of uh, unite, yeah, united um, economic governance for Europe to, to bring stability. Um, his uh, most important book uh, is The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money, published in uh, 1935. And I'm going to uh, talk a bit about this book, starting by the last sentences of the book uh, that give us good reasons to study the economic Nobel Prizes, actually. So the very last sentence are the following. The ideas of economists and political philosophers, both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by little else. Practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influences are usually the slaves of some defunct economists. Sooner or later, it is ideas, not vested interests, which are dangerous for good or evil. So, yes, so I'm not sure the camera is following me. Yeah, that's good. Yes, so, um, so yes, yeah, so, so economists have an influence, uh, and, uh, and this is why we're going to, to study their ideas. Um, so, why is this book uh, very famous? Uh, what are the ideas it contains? Um, again, it, um, it, it's insightful to look at the last chapter that uh, gives a conclusion to the book, and this last chapter starts with the following sentences. The outstanding faults of the economic society in which we live are its failure to provide for full employment and its arbitrary and inequitable distribution of wealth and incomes. The bearing of the foregoing theory on this is obvious. So here it says that there are two big problems uh, with, our, with his society, uh, full of unemployment and inequality, and that his theory addresses unemployment. It is a theory about uh, why is there unemployment and how can we solve that. And he goes on by saying that his book is also um, gives also some clues uh, about the second problem inequality. 
there are also two important respects in which this is relevant to the server. Okay, so the main goal of its general theory is to understand the cause and the cure of uh, what he calls involuntary unemployment, uh, as opposed to full employment. So full employment is a situation not where everybody has a job, but those who don't have a job uh, will find one soon. It's just that they're in a transition between jobs and they are, they are looking for one and uh, it won't stay long. Um, it's just um, the, the time to, to find one. Involuntary employment, so it's when there are more people unemployed and, and they, they want to find a job, they don't find one. The, the book was uh, written in the, the greatest uh, crisis of uh, capitalism, the Great Depression. Uh, so that started in, in 29 and that uh, ended uh, with, with uh, the start of the Second World War. Uh, so during this decade of the 30s, uh, the economy was depressed. The, the global GDP was 15% lower than it was before uh, in 1932. Uh, so it was much starker crisis than the one we experienced in 2008, where the global GDP uh, dropped by only 1%. And uh, also in 2008, uh, the world as a whole was, was richer and we had uh, unemployment benefits, we had social, social protection, all things that uh, were not fully uh, developed at the time. So people were really in dire misery uh, in many rich countries, like the US. And uh, you can find accounts of that uh, on books like The Grave of Wrath of John Steinbeck. And so uh, the ideas at the time was that there is something wrong uh, with the system. Uh, the state should intervene um, to, to, to solve the, this, this crisis. And uh, it was even more pressing that uh, there was an alternative, state socialism, um, which was very successful in the USSR uh, because they, they had developed uh, peasant and poor countries. Uh, they had uh, succeeded in bringing uh, this, this country um, industry in, uh, in a few, uh, in 15, uh, 20 years. Um, and, uh, and there was a full employment uh, in USSR. And um, Keynes uh, didn't want uh, socialism, as we see later on. He, he thought there was a solution uh, against unemployment that, was, that didn't imply the radical uh, revolution uh, of socialism. The problem is that uh, the economic theory at the time that we call classical economics um, advocated for laissez-faire, that is just don't do anything. If you're the government, let the markets uh, do, do whatever they want and uh, everything will work um, because market forces will put the economy back to the equilibrium. And actually the reason for classical economics, the reason for unemployment is too high and rigid, rigid wages. Um, and uh, if uh, wages were allowed to, to get lower, then uh, employers could, uh, could, could propose uh, lower wages and, uh, and hire more people because they could, uh, then jobs that, that are unprofitable at high wages uh, would become profitable. So, so more, uh, employment will uh, ensue. Um, so the, the state should not intervene uh, to influence uh, the interest rate, investment decisions, or the wages. Uh, let the market, uh, let's say fair the market and everything uh, will work out. And uh, so they didn't match the, the feeling that the state should intervene. And, uh, and here came Keynes and his theory to, to provide um, justification for the gut feeling that the state uh, should intervene. So his general theory is a theory of business cycles that are booms and recessions. So the, the economy sometimes uh, is booming, uh, gets richer and sometimes enter recessions. And uh, this book explains why. And it's a theory of a short run. Um, he is not interested in what happens in the long run. He's only interested in solving the, the crisis that was at his time and uh, to, to provide policies to solve this crisis. Uh, a famous quote of Keynes uh, is the following, in the long run, we are all dead. Economists set themselves too easy, too useless a task, 
if in tempestuous seasons, they can only tell us that when the storm is long past, the ocean is flat again. So basically, he says that uh, the, the theories of the classical economists apply well when uh, the ocean is flat, when there is no problem, when we're at equilibrium, but where we most need them when there is a storm, uh, they, they, they are inapplicable and they don't uh, give us any, any insight. So uh, in his theory, he takes uh, as fixed a number of variables that he knows uh, vary, but he's not interested in their evolution because they are too slow. And, uh, and so in the long run, in the short run, they don't matter. Um, these things he takes as fixed are the, what he calls the physical conditions of production. So the equipments in society, the skills, the technology, the degree of competition, tastes and habits, and the social structure. Any question? No. So uh, these slides um, will summarize the history of theory. And uh, so I, I start by, uh, by the goal and, and then we derive the, the, the causes um, of, of employment. That is the main goal of Keynes of full employment. And, uh, and at the end of the slide, we will understand the ultimate causes according to his theory. So for him, if uh, to produce um, one car, you need one worker. To produce two cars, you need two workers. So there is a direct proportional relationship between national production, which we also call uh, output or GDP or national income, uh, and employment. So if you want to reach full employment, you have to increase the national income. You have to increase output. Um, now, uh, maybe you're familiar with this equation. Uh, the national income can be decomposed into consumption and investment. Um, okay, because so what is produced in a given year in society is also what is earned uh, by people, is distributed to people and firms. That is why it's also equal to the national income. And as people receive this income, they decide to consume part of it and uh, to not consume part of it. And this part that is not consumed is actually uh, the products that are investment goods that uh, will help produce goods in uh, future periods, like machines, buildings, etc. cetera. And um, what matters uh, for Keynes is uh, investment. So to, to raise national income, you need to raise um, investment. There is, a, there is a good reason to, to, for that. It's like when you, when you look at the data, um, and you, you look at the, the evolution of uh, the growth of, uh, of national income over time. It's, uh, so here it's zero. And the growth by something like that. And the growth of consumption, it's, it's about the same. While the growth, I mean, less than, it's like that. It's much more viable, and um, and because it's much more uh, viable than uh, consumption, for Keynes, it's uh, where the cause of recession is. There is um, a lack of, of investment, and if um, we succeed in rising investment, it will raise uh, national income and then employment. So why is that so? Because if uh, you increase investment by uh, delta i, it will bring income to, uh, to some people because, okay, I decide to build a new machine. I will have to hire some workers. It's an income for these workers. These workers will consume part of their income. Uh, the part of their income they consume is called the propensity to consume. And um, because we're talking about uh, additional uh, income, for society as a whole. Here, uh, what matters is the marginal propensity to consume, that is the increment in consumption that um, arrives when uh, income uh, increases by, by one unit. And so because uh, people consume more following the increase in investment, um, then uh, firms uh, will need to produce more to accommodate for the increase in demand. And to produce more, they will need also to invest more. 
and to invest more, this will create a second order uh, increase in consumption, um, which, uh, and if, if you adapt all this, um, this series of uh, increase in, uh, in consumption, you find the, the multiplier K, the investment multiplier uh, that is rising in the propensity to consume, increasing in the, in the propensity to consume, and that relates uh, the increase in investment to the increase in the GDP, the national income. Is it clear or you have questions? Okay, so now uh, we need to raise investment, but how, what determines the level of investment? Well, it's investors or business uh, people who decide uh, whether to invest or not. And how do they decide to undertake a new project, new investment project? It depends on the returns they expect on this project. Okay, so if you build a new plant, you kind of try to guess uh, how much profits you will earn. So what will be your sales um, by, uh, yeah, so you, you have to yeah, estimate uh, how much you will sell uh, after building this, this, this plant. And um, the, the, your, your return on capital uh, expected, so what I write R E, E for expected, has to be higher than the rate of interest because you don't necessarily have uh, money to, uh, to, to build your plant. Or if you have it's better maybe to, to lend it if uh, your return is below uh, the rate of interest. So um, you will borrow money from the market, for example, the bond market, and um, at a rate R, which is the rate of interest, and undertake the project if you expect to make uh, a return higher than this rate of interest on your project. All right, so it means that uh, all investments uh, for which the expected rate of return RE is above the interest rate R are undertaken. So when we lower the interest rate, it will bring additional investment because it will uh, expand the amount of uh, investment that are profitable. Uh, now, what drive uh, expected return on capital? So. It depends on um, what uh, investors expect to sell in the future. So it depends on what they expect the economy to be like. Uh, will there be a, a new technology by their competitor that, uh, that will kill their business? Uh, are they optimistic with regard to uh, growth uh, of the economy or pessimistic? If they think the, the economy is in recession, uh, then they will not invest because um, because uh, people will not uh, buy their cars, they won't have any income. Um, now, there are also uh, psychological factors like expectations that drive uh, the interest rate. There are three fundamental psychological factors, according to Keynes, and one policy, that is the quality of money, uh, that have an influence on the interest rate. So the, the, the first uh, factor is the marginal propensity to consume. So for Keynes, it's, it's a psychological factor that you cannot really change, at least in the short run, uh, whether uh, for given income, people decide to, to spend all of them because they're shopping addicts or uh, to, to, put, uh, to, to keep all of them for later. Um, the, the, the expectations uh, and liquidity preferences are important. So the liquidity preference is the amount of money you want to have. So if you want to have uh, three uh, components uh, in your income, so, uh, so that is uh, your personal income, you will consume part of it, then you will keep part of it uh, with money, as a, yeah, on your bank account, your current account, and the rest, you will invest it in bonds. You don't see because of the light? Yeah. Ah, okay. Now can you see? Yeah, so you will consume part of your income. Uh, among the income you don't consume, you will keep part of it as, a, as money on your bank account, and the rest 
uh, you will invest it uh, on the bond or on the stock market. Um, do everyone know what a bond is? Yes? Okay. Um, so uh, liquidity preference is uh, how much uh, you will keep as money as opposed to bonds. And uh, so what would be the, so this is what we call hoarding, keeping your money under the mattress. And um, uh, maybe someone doesn't know what a bond is. Okay, they don't see the blackboard. Okay, sorry, <laughs> I will try not to, to write in the blackboard. Um, okay, so, so hoarding, uh, so why would you hold cash rather than bonds? Um, so two reasons. The first is uh, to make transaction. Uh, as I said, uh, you have to, to, to keep a certain amount of cash uh, for your daily expenses or also uh, the, the big expenses that, uh, yeah, that you risk to have, for example, the hospital or whatever. Um, and you also uh, want to, to keep cash uh, for a speculative motive. At least uh, certain people can engage in some uh, in such speculation. If you think you can secure profit from knowing better than the market what the future will bring forth. So if you think that the interest rate will rise, um, so a rise in the interest rate is, a, is the same as uh, a fall in the price of bonds. Okay, because um, uh, so a bond works the, the following way. I am uh, an investor um, and uh, I need money right now for, for my project. So uh, I will go to the market and say in one year, I will pay you $1,000. Uh, and, uh, and this is the bond of $1,000. And then the market uh, will buy it for less than $1,000 for let's say uh, $990. And the difference uh, of 10, uh, it's the interest rate. So in this case, the interest rate would be one uh, percent. And um, and in six months, if uh, for example you you have bought the bonds, okay, to, to the investor, in six months you, you need cash, so you want to sell the bond in the market. So now it's a bond that will expire in six months. So uh, if the interest rate hasn't changed, it's still one percent, we'll be able to sell the bond for nine hundred and ninety-five uh, euros. But if uh, the interest rate has increased, then uh, people would prefer to just buy a new bond for, from another company than to buy your bond. So you have to lower the price of your bond. Uh, so this is how uh, the, the price of bonds and the interest rate are inversely related. So if you think that the interest rate will rise in the future and that the price of bond will fall, you should keep your money for yourself and buy the bond in six months rather to buy it right now. This is a speculative uh, modding, uh, motive for hoarding. And so for case, the liquidity preferences are uh, driven by, so the transaction motive and the speculative motive and the speculative motive itself uh, is influenced by the expectation people have about the future. And uh, depending on the, the amount of uh, money people want to keep, uh, which is, uh, related to the amount of bond that uh, people want to, to purchase, uh, the interest rate will vary because if everyone, everybody wants to purchase bonds, then the price of bonds will decrease. It's the lower supply and demand. Um, and um, and the, um, no, sorry, the, the, if you want to purchase bonds, the price of bonds will increase and the interest rate will fall. Um, so um, what, what is the role for the, for the state here? Um, the state can directly, uh, or actually the central bank, uh, they can uh, act on the, the rise of, of interest or at the time of case, uh, we would say they, they decide the quantity of money, the money supply. So by injecting more money uh, in the economy, uh, people have more money either to to, to hoard or to uh, buy bonds, they will buy bonds uh, with it, which will lower the interest rate. And uh, then you can uh, go up the, all the, the causal chain, lowering the interest rate will uh, increase investment, 
which will eventually um, increase employment. The state can also intervene directly, uh, higher uh, the side at the investment level. The state can also invest directly by itself. This is called fiscal policy. So the state in this case will either uh, decrease uh, taxes or increase uh, spending uh, so that the deficit increases and um, the deficits of uh, the national budget is uh, a demand uh, from the, the public sector, the private sector, uh, so that with the higher deficits, the private sector uh, will have to we have more uh, means um, and uh, yeah, the demand increases. So does the national income. Are there any questions? Yes. Is it the same thing if uh, the state decides to increase the money supply uh, as it is to invest from a state perspective? Because just because the state brings money doesn't mean that more money they have to put it into the, the circulation, so they invest, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a very good question. Is it equivalent to to raise the money, the money supply or to invest directly? Uh, it's not, and I'm, doing, I'm going to talk about this in, in the next slides. So uh, Keynes uh, explained that sometimes uh, increasing the money supply won't work and you have to increase investment. Uh, yeah, some, uh, some other economists would, would say uh, the contrary, that, uh, that it's better to, to not uh, raise deficits and uh, it's better to act on the money supply. But, um, but no, they are not equivalent and we'll see why. Um, but the, um, it also depends how you do it. So if the states decide uh, to, to build uh, new, uh, new power plants or new uh, highways, you see it's not the same as if it lowers interest rate and then it will uh, simulate demand, but probably not for highways. So it will uh, not, even if it has the same impact in terms of GDP, it will not have the same impact in terms of uh, what activities are promoted. And same if the state decides to decrease certain taxes or to increase uh, certain spending, depending on what taxes and what spending they choose to act on, will not have the same uh, effect. Okay. And uh, increasing the quantity of money is, in some sense, it's more neutral because you, you treat everyone equally, but uh, only in a sense because it also has uh, some uh, distributive implication. And, uh, it comes with the, with the cost of not, not doing what you could have done otherwise. Okay, any other question? Um, I'm, I'm sorry. So, so can we say if we have an increase yield in bond market, we should decrease unemployment rates? Uh, no, so, uh, so um, okay. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. So the idea is, uh, it's, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure because what, what this says is that if the state wants to act, uh, it can uh, lower the, the interest rates and this will have an impact on employment. But if the state doesn't act, things will, will still move uh, by themselves uh, in the economy. And, uh, and, and so the, the price of bonds may, may move in some directions not uh, related to, uh, to, to, to that because you can have a, a common factor that influences both employment and the price of bonds. Uh, yeah. Um, so the, the Keynes general theory is a, a non-mathematical book, uh, although it's theoretical. And uh, why isn't there many math? Uh, primarily because it was um, um, written uh, for politicians, decision makers, to provide them uh, an ideology they could use um, to decide on their policy. It was aimed at the general public rather than to economic theories. Uh, it explains uh, economic, okay. actually I'm gonna skip uh, these slides. Um, no, okay, I'm going to, to see the middle of the, of the slide. Um, yeah, so, so um, what's important in this slide is that um, for Keynes, 
there, there, may, there may be a natural level of involuntary unemployment that is suboptimal, that, uh, that oscillates uh, under full employment, but it is not established by laws of necessity. And by that, he means that the state can intervene and, and uh, change it. And full employment can be attained through different kinds of policy, voluntary tax policies or fiscal policy. Fiscal policy is the level of deficit and taxes, everything that involves taxes. And uh, an interesting uh, outcome of uh, his theory is the paradox of thrift. Um, so the paradox of thrift is that if everyone in the economy wants to increase their savings, the aggregate saving for the whole economy could actually decrease. So why is that so? Because if everyone wants to increase their saving, it means that they will consume less. And because they will consume less, the expectation of investors uh, about the future will, will be more grim because they see uh, people buy less than before. So I will invest less than before. The level of investment decreases, then the national income decreases, depressed, de depresses the economy. So some people lose their job or some people lose income. And uh, overall, as people get uh, poorer, they cannot uh, save as much as they expected. And in proportion, they could have saved as much as they expected, but in total, the level of saving uh, would have decreased. So this is the product of thrift. Thrift is a synonym for uh, saving, actually. Okay. Now, um, let's turn to Keynes political ideas. Uh, why? Because uh, first of all, Keynes was not only an economist, he was also a politician. Uh, he became a baron, Lord, Lord Keynes in 1942, and then uh, took a seat in the House of Lords uh, in uh, the UK. He was uh, always in the Liberal Party, but uh, promoted uh, an alliance between the Liberal Party and the Labour Party. And um, this is um, what he says in his uh, concluding chapter of his book. I believe that there is social and psychological justification for significant inequalities of incomes and wealth, but not for such large, large disparities as exist today. There are valuable human activities which require the motive of money-making and the environment of private wealth ownership for their full, for their full fruition. So here it means that uh, people need incentives to work. Uh, if everybody would, would receive the same uh, income, uh, people would just get lazy, not work, and it wouldn't work. But it is not necessary for the stimulation of these activities that the game should be played for such high stakes as at present. Much lower stakes will serve the purpose equally well as soon as the players are accustomed to them. So here it says that sure we need incentives, but we don't need to, to give Bill Gates a hundred uh, to reward Bill Gates a hundred billion dollars. Maybe with just uh, ten million dollars, it would be. Um, Thus, we might end in practice, there being nothing in this which is unattainable, at an increase in the volume of capital until it ceases to be scarce, so that the functionless investor will, will no longer receive a bonus, and at a scheme of direct taxation, which allows the intelligence and determination and executive skill of the financier, the entrepreneur, et hoc genus omne, so all those are the, of this kind, who are certainly so fond of their craft that their labor could be obtained much cheaper than at present, to be harnessed to the service of community on reasonable terms of reward. So here he calls for the euthanasia of rentiers. It's uh, an expression that is also in this chapter. Um, he thinks that um, when uh, capital in the economy, so capital, the amount of machines, of buildings, etc., thinks that uh, the investors and the wealthy uh, people own, when capital will be abundant, then these people will not be able to claim as much return on this capital as now, and this will be better for society. Uh, the rate of return on capital will be lower, so, so there will be less inequality uh, because uh, less profit going to, to function less invest investor. So he really like investors, he thinks that they are the uh, the one who, who drive the economy, but um, 
what he doesn't like is uh, when investors receive uh, a rent uh, just by, uh, by having uh, money, just like in a poker uh, economy. So um, he was a reformist. He sought a middle ground between uh, state socialism and unfettered capitalism. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm going to quote also extensively another part of this chapter uh, to see what concrete policies he promotes. The state will have to exercise a guiding influence on the propensity to consume, partly through its scheme of taxation, partly by fixing the rate of interest, and partly perhaps in other ways. So the state should use all the tools at the disposal to uh, arrive at its objective of full employment and uh, not too unequal a society. Furthermore, it seems unlikely that the influence of banking policy of, on the rate of interest will be sufficient by itself to determine an optimum rate of investment. So here it says that uh, the, acting on the money supply may not always suffice. I conceive therefore that a somehow comprehensive socialization of investment will prove the only means of securing an approximation to full employment. And socialization of investment, it means that the state will decide uh, what to do with, uh, like it will directly uh, comment some big investment, like in infrastructure. Uh, at his time, it was a uh, railroad, highways. In uh, our times, it would be uh, for the ecological transition, or maybe to bring uh, electricity, sanitation, uh, drinkable water in countries where it is still needed. So um, he thinks that the state has a, has a role to play here. Though this need not exclude all manners of, of compromises and devices by which public authority will cooperate with private initiative. But beyond this, no obvious case is made out for a system of state socialism, which would embrace most of the economic life of the community. It is not the ownership of the instrument of production, Ownership of the instrument of production is basically the definition of communism, uh, which is important for the state to assume. If the state is able to determine the aggregate amount of resources devoted to augmenting the instruments and the basic rates of reward to those who own them, it will have accomplished all that is necessary. Moreover, the necessary measures of socialization can be introduced gradually and without a break in the general traditions of society. So he's not a revolutionary, and he thinks that, uh, okay, if there is 10% unemployment, maybe the state can come and directly uh, work for this 10% uh, an inactive person, but the state doesn't need to uh, command what the 90% uh, other do. Uh, the authoritarian state systems of today, so USSR, but also maybe uh, the, um, the Third Reich, um, seem to solve uh, the problem of unemployment at the expense of efficiency and of freedom. It is certain that the world will not much longer tolerate the unemployment, which, apart from brief intervals of excitement, is associated, and in my opinion, inevitably associated, with present day capitalistic individualism. But it may be possible, by a right analysis of the problem, to cure the disease with pre preserving efficiency and freedom. So he thinks that capitalism is deficient, but capitalism can be amended so that uh, it becomes a good system. And, uh, and state socialism uh, is not needed or is not uh, desirable because uh, we lose it, people lose their, their free initiative uh, of doing business. Um, so Keynes had a, a long lasting uh, influence. The general theory stirred up a series of works uh, after Keynes that uh, interpreted uh, it, that formalized it in a mathematical way and uh, adapted it, uh, sometimes transforming it uh, completely. Um, Keynesianism uh, dominated uh, economics until the 70s, so for 30, 40 years, um, even though it was uh, sometimes uh, sort of type of Keynesianism that was quite far from what Keynes uh, have thought. And Keynes was not alone uh, in developing his theory. 
uh, rather it, it was more like the superstar uh, economist at the time. Uh, so people all read his book uh, and it was well written. Uh, but uh, the ideas were ideas in the zeitgeist. Doesn't mean that it was the only economic ideas. That there was uh, still a, a strong uh, classical school uh, of economics, uh, but um, many similar ideas developed in the 20s uh, in Stockholm uh, by economists like Bixell, Lindahl, Mirdal, and Olin. That still got the Nobel Prize. You see this sign. Uh, it's the first time you, you see it, but uh, it represents um, a Nobel Prize. It's like a, a medal. So the Nobel Prize is a medal. Um, and um, the problem is that these guys uh, were writing in, in German and uh, Michel Kaleski uh, was writing in Polish. Uh, so even though his model was actually more general than Keynes and was already mathematical, uh, it was not uh, very well known. Uh, but at Cambridge, um, Keynes had uh, many collaborators uh, that helped him a lot uh, with the writing of the book uh, by um, reviewing some draft of the book and uh, even directly contributing to the book. Um, and it's among uh, his closest collaborators that um, uh, is, is yeah, some of these closest collaborators who are the first to see the limits of uh, his policy recommendation. Um, and uh, notably the fact that uh, demand activation so the fact that the, the state uh, increases uh, demand by, uh, by lowering the interest rate or by increasing investments uh, can create inflation. And uh, if inflation is, uh, is too high, it, it can be a problem. So I'm going to quote uh, John Robinson uh, on this. The very success of an employment policy creates new problems. So an employment policy is the demand activation I've just talked about. In a private enterprise system, the existence of an unemployed workers' reserve played an important role. So does someone know what the, an unemployed workers' reserve is? So it's a, a Marxian uh, term to designate uh, the unemployed, unemployed people. Because uh, from a Marxist perspective, um, unemployment has a function uh, it serves uh, to make the workers uh, obedient, docile, and uh, to make them accept low wages because they fear becoming unemployed. And, uh, and Marx called uh, the unemployed people the workers' reserve army. Um, and so uh, John Robinson says, uh, yeah, they, they have an important role uh, to play because unemployment maintained discipline in industry gave to the production system enough flexibility to adapt itself to technological change and demand fluctuation. And by slowing down the tendency to rise of nominal wages, ensure a sufficient stability in the value of money. To obtain all this, unemployment was a cruel and costly method, but if it must be abolished, other means have to be found to fulfill the same functions. And actually, Keynes uh, reckoned uh, in the, um, the end of his life, uh, that there could be a problem of, of inflation uh, if uh, his theory would, would apply, and then said that uh, demand activation should be stopped uh, at the point where inflation is too high. And uh, post Canadian economists like uh, John Robinson uh, recommended to, to avoid uh, too high inflation to control prices for monopolistic industry. Like if you think of uh, Microsoft, for example, to avoid uh, paying windows too high and paying too much rent uh, to, to, to Microsoft, uh, John Robinson would have uh, determined uh, publicly, uh, collectively, the, the price uh, we pay for, for, for this software and uh, keeping the, the, the prices uh, low. Is there any question? Um, I think. Yeah, before the post, I, I will uh, do the last slide, uh, the, the first part of, the, of this lecture, uh, which is about uh, post Canadian economics. So uh, none of these uh, economists got the Nobel Prize, but uh, I think it's still important to, to talk about them because they are the economists that uh, followed Keynes' ideas in the most uh, faithful way. Um, 
most of them, uh, I mean, the, the school started in the University of Cambridge, so Kent University. And in general, they promoted uh, heavy public intervention and uh, structural changes, but just fine tuning. Uh, they, they were advocating for strong public policies um, that, that would uh, really, really change uh, the society. And in a more theoretical way, their main assumptions were completely different to uh, the other economists. And uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, this crowd uh, remained a minority uh, in the profession. And, um, and yeah, so uh, nowadays, uh, the dominant, uh, the mainstream uh, strand of economics uh, does not use their models, uh, does not use the same assumption. Um, and um, yeah. Um, so these assumptions are uh, no substitutability between uh, factors of production. So that is, uh, to produce uh, one car, you, produce, you need uh, one ton of steel and, uh, and one worker. You cannot uh, substitute steel for workers. You cannot produce the same car with uh, half the steel and, and, and twice the amount of workers. This is what it means. Uh, the profit share is um, the, the, the share of national income that goes to uh, capital owners. Uh, what uh, post keynesian economists would call uh, the capitalists. So the, what is not the profit share is the wage, wage, the wage share. So right when you're a company, you like most of your expenses are, are wages of your employees and the rest is uh, to pay uh, interest to the bank or interest uh, or dividends to the shareholders. Uh, this is the profit share. Um, and so they say that the profit share is determined by the balance of power between the capitalists and the workers. So if workers unionize, uh, if there is a, the, the, a strong uh, socialist party uh, that uh, threatens to, to win the election, then they will obtain high wages. If on the contrary, uh, capitalists are powerful because they can uh, capture uh, the, 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 the state uh, decision and, uh, and there is high unemployment, so, so uh, workers cannot bargain uh, uh, well, then the profit share will be high. Um, so already these two uh, assumptions are different from the, the assumption of neoclassical economics that we study uh, afterwards. Uh, the, the neoclassical, we think that to some extent there is substitutability between factor. Okay, maybe uh, you don't need uh, necessarily one ton of steel, you can have uh, one ton of copper instead. Uh, to produce the car, and that the profit share uh, for them um, is, a, is, is as a natural level, because the, the return to capital has a natural level, and the wage has a natural level, and this level is the what we call the marginal productivity. So uh, if a firm uh, hires uh, one additional person, this will bring some uh, revenue, some additional revenues to the company, and this is the marginal productivity of this worker. And this is how much this worker should be paid according to neoclassical economists. And same for an additional unit of capital. Uh, the, this additional unit should be paid uh, by its marginal productivity, which will determine the interest rate. Um, so there is no room for uh, bargaining be between uh, workers and capitalists uh, for neoclassical. The third important assumption is the way prices are determined. So for uh, neoclassical economists, prices uh, emerge from the, the law of supply and demand and uh, from the optimization of people. So if I'm a firm, I try to, to sell at the highest, not necessarily the highest price, but the price that will bring me the, 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 the largest profit. And, uh, and if I'm a consumer, I look for the, for the cheapest price. Um, but for post nation economies, uh, prices, people don't always optimize, and prices equal the production costs plus a markup that is kind of conventional, that, uh, that depends on this, this profit share that, that emerges from the bargaining. And, uh, and the market varies uh, depending on the sector, depending on their degree of monopoly. So uh, 
Microsoft will be able to, to, to put a high market because it's a monopoly on Windows. But uh, a an Apple producer, <laughs> well, I'm talking about like the Apple you can eat, uh, then there is no monopoly, it's competitive. So the market will be low. Um, so yeah, I'm going to present rapidly some uh, of the economists. Uh, Arad was the first to propose a theory of, of growth. Um, and, uh, and and I've written this equation that uh, I will uh, will show a few slides later with other uh, theories of growth. Um, so the, the question here is uh, what makes an economy growing? Uh, Kaleski um, proposed a, a model um, with a, with a Marxian influence with two classes: capitalists who earn profit and save all of it, and uh, proletarians or workers who earn only wages and consume all of it. So it's a simplification of reality, but uh, uh, it was uh, reused by uh, Cal Law, who showed that um, the, the, the sharing between profit and wages, so the, this profit share, explains the activity level, investment, and growth. It's, uh, it's related to, to, to Keynes, because um, Keynes uh, had this idea, and people at the time had this idea, which is uh, actually verified in the data, that uh, when you're richer, uh, you consume a lower part of your income. Okay, if, you, if you're poor, you, you, you don't have enough to save, so you consume everything. If you're uh, Bill Gates, you can consume everything you want. So, uh, so $1 billion will not make you consume more. And uh, so here, uh, the caricature is that uh, capitalists save everything, and uh, workers consume everything, but uh, in reality, the capitalists are richer, and so they save more. And um, with the Keynesian theory, saving is of no use for full employment for the level of activities. So um, by shifting, uh, by, by increasing the, the wage share and by decreasing the profit share, then the, the propensity to consume of the entire society will increase, and the level of activity employment will increase. Now, uh, John Robinson. Um, so there are, there are not many uh, uh, famous women economists at the time, but uh, she was actually one of the major economists uh, of the period. And uh, if she didn't win the, the Nobel Prize, it's probably because uh, her ideas were, were political ideas were too radical. And the, the Nobel Committee didn't want to, to give her uh, uh, the, the ability to, to express her socialist uh, feeling, but she, she's really, uh, she has really contributed to, to economic theory uh, by extending uh, tech theory to the long run and also introducing the concept of uh, monopsony. So monopoly, you probably know, it's uh, when there is only one seller in the market. Like uh, Microsoft, uh, they can decide whatever price they want. Um, and monopsony is when there is only one buyer in the market. And uh, like monopoly, they have a strong bargaining power. And so they can uh, obtain the good they want at a low price. And she applied her concept of monopsony to um, the labor market. She said that in some uh, markets, uh, like, um, I don't know if you, if you want to work uh, in, the, in the police, you're a police woman or policeman, then you have only one uh, possible employer. And so this employer of the state has a strong bargaining power and will make you accept uh, all the, the condition uh, they, they want. And this, uh, so she studied, so she, she showed how uh, monopoly and monopsony in different sectors um, influence uh, the price and in turn uh, determined the level of activity and employment and so on, which actually provided a theory that it's much more convincing than Keynes uh, theory. Um, and, um, and the last one I want to talk about is Piero Sraffa, who wrote a really good book, uh, uh, which uh, is entitled Production of Commodities by Means of Commodities, a prelude to the critique of, the critique of uh, economics. And um, in this book, he, he, he makes this assumption of uh, no substitutability between factors. So he, he sees the, 
the economy as a matrix. I will talk about this, this uh, view of the economy uh, in a few lectures again. But uh, the idea is that uh, to, to, come, to build one car, you need uh, one ton of steel and one worker. And, um, and it's the same for every product in the economy. And uh, there is an, an, um, and there is only free, one free parameter in the economy, which is the profit share, and uh, or the rate of return on capital to our audience. And uh, once uh, this uh, rate of return on capital is, is fixed, all prices um, uh, derive from, from it. And he showed uh, how to how all the prices uh, in a, in a in a theoretical economy um, uh, emerge from the state of the available technologies and this rate of profit. And thereby, he showed that uh, prices and the rate of profit don't have a natural value because the, the rate of profit, the, the rate of return on capital, can take any value, which directly contradicts the neoclassical view that the rate of return on capital is as natural value, which is the marginal productivity of capital. And what Piero Safa showed is that this notion of capital that uh, the neoclassical economics, economists use uh, has no sense as, uh, because it's an abstraction that aggregates together uh, machines, uh, buildings, plants, all kinds of things that are different. And uh, what he showed is that basically they cannot be aggregating, aggreg aggregated because um, the, the duration to build them uh, is, is different. It's, it's quite technical, but, but he showed that the way uh, neoclassical economists uh, define the rate of return uh, of capital uh, is flawed because uh, it, rely, it relies on the definition of capital, which the value of capital, as he showed, uh, depends on the rate of return of capital. So there is a circular definition here. And um, it started a uh, controversy between uh, Cambridge, uh, UK, and Cambridge, Massachusetts, where there is MIT and Harvard, where uh, the, the other guys uh, were. And, uh, and so the, the American guys uh, ended up the, the controversy uh, by saying, OK, you know what? You're right. Uh, so our, our notion is, is ill-defined. Uh, but we're, we're going to continue to use it because uh, it's easier. And, uh, and here we are, we are continuing uh, the, nowadays to use this, uh, this flawed notion of, of capital uh, because, uh, because we have uh, only one variable in our equation instead of 100. Yes? We had a question regarding that. So he said the post Keynesian didn't go very far, actually, the economic history. Was it because sort of other were super influential, or what were the reasons that this theory didn't go so popular? Yeah. Okay, so why didn't uh, the post connection become more popular? Uh, I don't know, uh, to be honest. There, there are still post connection economists nowadays. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, can, I cannot say. Probably because um, they, there were other uh, popular economists at the time uh, that I will talk about in the second part of the, of the lecture, and people follow them. And uh, so, in general, economics is, is really done in the US, in the, in the big universities in the US, you know, like uh, Stanford, uh, Chicago, Harvard, and so on. And uh, everything that's happening elsewhere, in particular in Europe, uh, is, is, is forgotten. Uh, there, there were also very interesting uh, macroeconomic theories in the 70s developed uh, in France uh, that, that were arguably uh, solving many deficiencies of, uh, of other macroeconomic uh, uh, models, but uh, but they were forgotten. Because of the language, or um, so 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 uh, until the forties, uh, people were still writing in their own language, but uh, but uh, after the war, uh, everybody publishes in the same journals that are in English. So uh, so I think it's not really the language; uh, it's, it's probably more linked to the. Maybe the side of the market, maybe in the US, uh, you know, it's a, it's a small world where uh, every, everyone that is important is or goes. And so, uh, and so they talk mostly to each other and don't uh, pay attention to what's happening elsewhere. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure about the answer. Yes? Yeah. Could also be that the people who would study the economy 
Yeah, so that's a good point. It's uh, the political ideas of the post Keynesian economists, maybe that uh, that uh, preventing them from uh, for, from becoming dominant. Um, so I, I mentioned John Robinson, who, who deserved the prize and didn't get it. There is also uh, John Kenneth Galbraith, who was a major uh, economist, economist in the in the fifties and sixties. And uh, and actually, I allow you to to to, to make your essay. Uh, from uh, his work, although he didn't get the Nobel Prize, uh, because he also would have deserved it, but uh, probably didn't get it uh, because of uh, his uh, leftist aliens. Yes. Yes. Um, that there is one more less um, It's a good question because um, I, I'm, I'm not sure uh, what, what they what they think, uh, but um, but I would say that uh, there is there is a long term goal that is somehow unrelated to, to employment. Uh, and there is uh, short-term uh, fluctuations that uh, have an impact on employment. And uh, Ken's theory is in the short run. So what Ken shows is that if you increase the level of activity in the short run, it will increase employment in the short run. But if you increase the trend, because the, the long-term growth actually uh, is not um, driven by uh, an increase in employment, it's driven by technological progress or by the accumulation of capital. Uh, so, in a sense, uh, long, yeah, raising raising the, the level of long-term growth would not have a, a many impact on employment. Yeah, this was a picture of uh, students uh, throwing from abroad in the program. So, hi to hi to you. Um, so the, the second part of the of the class um, is about uh, what is called the neoclassical synthesis, um, which is um, the, the synthesis of uh, Keynesian ideas with uh, classical ideas, so before Keynes, that emerged uh, in the 40s and 50s. And um, so, yes, because as soon as the, the general theory was published, economists uh, tried to express it uh, in a mathematical framework and uh, to express it in a way that uh, allowed a comparison with classical phenomena uh, to test which theory was right or to reconcile uh, both theories. The most influential uh, such attempt was by John Hicks, uh, who wrote a paper uh, titled Keynes and the Classics in 37, uh, which proposed the model called IS. LM. And it was very popular because it provided a simple graphical interpretation to case ideas that I'm trying to, to explain. So the, the IS um, LM is a is a I, yeah, is a is a model um, that considers uh, two markets uh, in particular, the, the good markets and the money markets. And that assumes that uh, the equilibrium uh, on these markets determine what will happen on the other markets that are the bond markets and uh, the labor market. And so um, this graph uh, has the level of activity Y on the X axis and the interest rate R on the Y axis and present uh, the equilibrium of society which is the intersection uh, of two curves, the IS curve, which is the equilibrium on the goods market and the LM curve, which is the equilibrium on the money market. It's a short run analysis uh, and it takes even more things uh, fixed uh, than Keynes because it takes the quantity of money as fixed, which will be denoted by M and the prices as fixed as well as technology and capital. 
Um, now, why uh, are, are, do these curves have uh, this shape? Uh, we're going to see. I can uh, already explain why the IS curve uh, is downward sloping. Because um, investment must be, must be equal to saving. It's an accounting uh, equality. Uh, that says that uh, what people don't consume, it's what they save. And what people don't consume, it's, uh, it's uh, what is uh, used uh, to in as investment. It's investment goods. Um, and as we've seen earlier, when we decrease the rate of interest, the level of investment and the level of activity increases. So this is why it's downward sloping. Now, how do we construct the LM curve? To, to understand this, we need to uh, show another graph that shows uh, the rate of interest in function of the quality of money. And here you have uh, also the intersection of two curves. The first one is the quantity of money, uh, big M, that is fixed uh, for the model, determined by the, the, the central bank, basically. And the second one is the liquidity preference. And uh, as we've seen earlier, uh, when the rate of interest decreases, the demand for money increases. You can understand that. Uh, for here, we take Y as given. We can understand that because um, the when the, the, the rate of interest is low, let's say zero, then uh, you're indifferent between having a bond that. Uh, reward that pays you zero or having money. You even prefer money because uh, it's more practical to have cash than a bond. But as the rate of interest increases, you uh, are encouraged to buy bonds and, uh, and to hold less cash. And now the equilibrium rate of interest, according to Higgs, uh, is at the intersection of these two curves, where the demand for money equals the supply of money. And um, this reasoning was uh, for a given uh, level of output Y. Now, if you increase the level of output, you will shift, shift the, the, the demand for money to the, to the right, to upwards. You will, you will increase the demand for money because uh, people have more income, so they have uh, more demand for money for transaction purposes. Um, and so uh, as the demand for money increases, so does the equilibrium interest rate. And we see a positive link between national income Y and the equilibrium interest rate. And this is why an curve is upward sloping. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, so something uh, that will be useful later on is the case where the, the liquidity uh, preference, the demand for money, is flat. Um, for example, because the rate of interest is zero, uh, at zero, uh, the, 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 you can increase the quantity of money. People uh, will, uh, will just uh, take more money. They will not uh, buy bonds. So uh, if we have no effect on the rate of interest, it will remain uh, zero. Uh, this is what we call the liquidity trap, where basically in the situation of uh, liquidity trap, where the liquidity preference uh, is flat, or the rate of interest is already zero, then the action of the central bank to increase the, the amount of money will have no effect. No effect on the interest rate, so no effect on the level of activity. Okay, so, so now you maybe you understand uh, why we have this uh, this shape for the for the two curves and um, what is interesting um, okay i think the first two lines i've just explained them and um, and even the, the the third one so that's what i said so when you, you increase the, the the money supply uh, it's equivalent i won't explain why but maybe you can Think about it yourself that it will shift the LM curve to the right when you increase M. And uh, if the IS curve is, is here and the LM curve is flat where it crosses the IS curve, then you can shift it to the right. It will not have any effect on the equilibrium of the economy. It will not have any effect on the interest rate or on the national income. We just uh, 
raises prices into inflation. Um, so uh, this is a liquidity trap situation that uh, often happens uh, during recessions. And actually nowadays, uh, we're somehow in a liquidity trap uh, situation because interest rates are close to zero in, uh, in advanced uh, economies, uh, high income economies, I should say. And, um, and, uh, and so and actually this is why the central bank is resorting to, uh, to, to what we call non-conventional policies, uh, cannot lower the interest rate. So what they do is a quantitative easing, uh, which is um, another way to stimulate demand, uh, not acting on the rate of interest, but acting on the, the, the quantity of, of risk that uh, banks uh, have and, uh, and, and, and can handle. So they basically take the risky assets of bank, give them cash. And so the, with the cash, the banks can, uh, again, uh, uh, provide um, risky uh, lending. Um, now, when the, we are in the liquidity trap and the monetary policy doesn't work, uh, and you don't want to do a quantitative easing that also has uh, some problems, uh, you can, what you can do is uh, increase investment directly. Uh, so the state can invest directly and this will, shift the IS curve to the, to the right and uh, increase uh, GDP without even increasing the interest rate. So we have the, the best of the two worlds. Uh, so in this case, an equity trap boosting investment is efficient and it would be exactly the contrary if the LM curve was uh, vertical or it crosses the, the IS curve. Uh, in this case, it would be a monetary policy that is useful. So, what uh, X achieves with this uh, model is uh, to provide um, a, an interpretation of Keynes, where Keynes is just a particular case of uh, the classical economics, where uh, the LM curve is flat at the beginning, then the force stopping, then vertical. For classical economics, uh, LM curves would be always uh, a force stopping. And, um, and increasing uh, investment would always lead to uh, raising the interest rate, uh, which would uh, counteract the effect of, uh, of higher uh, income because it's really to inflation. You would still have, you still have an, uh, higher income, but at the, the cost of higher interest and higher inflation. So, um, so he showed that uh, contrary to, to, to what Keynes uh, claimed that uh, his theory uh, had nothing to do with classical. For Higgs, uh, it was just a particular case of, uh, of classical economics, where the LM curve has a, it is, has a particular shape. Uh, it was popular because uh, it's a versatile model. It encompasses both theory, uh, different economic situations, depending on the shape of the curves. However, uh, it somehow misrepresents uh, Keynes' theory, uh, because here, uh, everything is deterministic. There is no room for expectation. Everything depends on current income and not on expected future income. But in case theory, what drives investment is the expectation. And this is not modeled uh, in, um, in, in, in ISLM. Uh, and time also is not modeled. It's a static model to study uh, dynamics. So it's a, it's a bit weird. Uh, and uh, if you haven't understood uh, this model, uh, it's not a problem. It's maybe because uh, the model is uh, it's not so good, it's not because you're not so smart. And actually, uh, Higgs uh, later said that this uh, model is more a classroom gadget and, uh, and didn't really believe in it. And, um, and yeah, but still, this model is, is, uh, is one of the, the three uh, key things uh, that helped uh, Keynesian economics uh, become very popular although it's kind of a trial to Keynes, uh, together with uh, the application of Keynes to the data with econometric modeling and uh, with the Philip curves. The Philip curves, I'm going to talk about it later. It introduces price in the ISLM model. Because here, prices are taken as fixed. Um, so a word on, uh, on John Hicks. Uh, so he'd be the, the first Nobel Prize uh, I'll talk about. So he received the Nobel Prize, uh, one of the, uh, was one of the, the earliest to, to receive it for his contribution both to general equilibrium theory 
uh, which he developed in value and capital and uh, where ISLM is just a part of it. And um, to his contribution for to microeconomics. So here I can make a, a detour, small detour to talk about um, uh, some notions in, introduced in microeconomics that uh, we still use uh, in research. The first one is the Caldor Hicks improvement. So um, it's a generalization of the Pareto improvement. Uh, does someone know what the, what the the Pareto improvement is. Exactly. That no one can be made better off by. Um, wait, that, that's a Pareto optimum. Uh, Pareto improvement, it's a change um, in, the, in the situation, let's say, of income, actually, of utilities, uh, that uh, where no one loses. Okay. And um, and uh, um, yes, and uh, Caldor Hicks improvement is a change in the situation where some can lose, but we could compensate them by uh, taking uh, some resources from those who win from the change and give it to those who lose, and this uh, would uh, this would be a brighter improvement. So Caldor Hicks improvement. Uh, is useful when you want to study, for example, uh, redistribution. Like if uh, if you want to to redistribute from the rich to the to the poor, it cannot be a comparative improvement, but it can be a Caldor Hicks improvement as long as uh, you don't uh, decrease the, the the level of activity so much in society uh, that uh, that uh, you cannot compensate the, the could, you could not theoretically compensate the winner with the amount of resources you, you now have. It's a Caldor Higgs improvement. And, uh, and you can also uh, have a notion of Caldor Higgs uh, optimum uh, using this notion. The second uh, thing is the compensated demand function. So if you already had a class of microeconomics, it should just be a reminder. Um, so um, is the minimum uh, expenditure level such that the utility function is above uh, a given level. And, uh, and this uh, compensated uh, demand function helps uh, isolate two effects, uh, the substitution effect from the income effect, which will be neutralized uh, when taking the, when fixing, taking as given the, the level of utility. The substitution effect, we can take the example of uh, yeah, plane tickets. So if uh, plane tickets get more expensive, uh, then you will fly less for two reasons. The first one is that uh, if the other prices of the economy stay constant, your purchasing power will decrease. This is the income effect. And the second uh, reason is that uh, instead of taking the plane, you will take the, the train. This is the substitution effect. And uh, lastly, uh, John Hicks wrote a theory of economic history. And, uh, and he wished that we had remembered him for, for this rather than for the ISLM uh, model. Um, in his book, he applies uh, economic reasoning uh, to history and uh, ask himself questions like, uh, why do uh, kings, who are the, the more, most powerful guy in a, in a country in the Middle Age, uh, why, why were they often bankrupt and lacking uh, of money? Uh, the first reason is that uh, it's hard to, to collect taxes when the activity is dispersed in many villages. And so here, when the trade uh, developed, and um, activity started concentrating in the few towns, few cities. Uh, it, uh, it was easier for kings to, 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 to collect taxes to get uh, money. And the second reason is that uh, bankers uh, do not necessarily want to, 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 to lend to, to kings, uh, which can seem surprising because, uh, because a king can, can pay back, he uh, can collect taxes, he's rich. But uh, the reason is that um, to enforce a contract, generally, you appeal to uh, a higher authority, like the, the judges. But in the case of the, the king, there is no higher authority. So if the king decides not to pay back, then uh, he can just uh, not pay back and he can even kill the banker uh, if he wants to. So, uh, so the bankers would be reluctant to, to finance uh, the kings. Yes. So, um, now, um, what we call the, 
yeah, we talk about the neoclassical synthesis, um, which happened in a period where uh, Keynesian policies were applied uh, throughout uh, income countries and, and, uh, and were successful. Uh, during the World War II, uh, the, the, the war uh, economy uh, gave everybody a job, even uh, women entered uh, massively the labor force at the time. And after World War II, um, state interventions uh, helped uh, raising um, aggregate demand. You can think of the Marshall Plan in Europe or of uh, uh, social spending program uh, in the US. There were a war against poverty by, uh, I remember, uh, maybe? remember, me, you know, which American president. But uh, anyway, so, um, so Keynesianism was the mainstream. And uh, at the same time, economists strived to uh, complement the general theory with uh, missing features. Uh, the mathematical form formalization. Uh, some uh, tried what we call the neoclassical program, which is to reformulate uh, Keynes in a general equilibrium framework. So what we call general equilibrium, it's um, a set of equations that uh, describe the, the economy in its uh, generality, so in its, uh, at the whole, and um, where there are different agents, like firms, individuals, everyone optimizing um, their utility under some constraints, like they have a budget uh, that constrain them, and uh, with the assumption that market clear. So market clearing, it means that uh, no one is willing to, to buy or supply more of a good at its current price, and uh, the, the, the important example here is the labor market. When we say that there is involuntary employment, it means that uh, some unemployed people would be, would be ready to accept a job at the current wage. And uh, if uh, there is uh, involuntary employment, it's probably because the market is not clear. Or at least that would be the Keynesian explanation uh, these uh, people, Klein, Patinkin, uh, sought for uh, other explanation um, that could reconcile uh, case inventory and employment with a framework where uh, markets clear. But actually, it didn't uh, really uh, deliver this neoclassical uh, program because there is kind of a, a deep contradiction between the Keynesian ideas of inventory and employment and uh, market clearing. Um, so, um, yeah, another missing feature is uh, to extend uh, the analysis to the long run. I will, I will call that uh, growth models in a, in a minute. Um, and, um, and to develop uh, data-driven and pretty tested econometric models. We we'll also talk about that, as well as um, extend the theory to, to specific question that was not addressed or uh, refine certain points. And um, yeah, so as I said, the neoclassical program didn't uh, deliver. So what we call the neoclassical synthesis, it's not really a comprehensive model. Uh, rather, it's uh, various models, uh, each of which uh, describes one aspect of uh, society and uh, that borrow both from Kant's ideas and from uh, classical economics. And they have in common that um, they, they use statist uh, mathematical modeling became the norm at the time. And uh, that uh, most of, of, the, of this, uh, this crowd uh, endorsed uh, public intervention. So they were Canadian uh, in, in their recommendation, if not in their assumptions. And that's why uh, the neoclassical synthesis is sometimes called neo Keynesianism. Um, uh, are there any questions? Okay, so I have um, often slides like this where I present one uh, Nobel Prize in one slide. So here it's uh, Franco Modigliani, uh, kind of a representative figure of the neoclassical synthesis because his assumptions and uh, results depart from Keynes, but uh, as a person, he defends inter interventionism. 
and he, he made two influential contributions. Yeah, at least two. Um, first one is life cycle theory. So for Keynes um, and for people before Modigliani, uh, your consumption level depends on your income and the richer you are, uh, the, the more you consume, but, uh, but your marginal propensity consume decreases. So, so, so you consume more in, uh, in absolute level, but less in relative uh, level to your income. And uh, if we apply this to uh, society, we would, uh, because the society gets richer over time, uh, we should see that uh, society save more and more over time in relative term. And uh, this is not what we observe. Saving rate is often constant uh, when, uh, when an economy grows. And um, this is uh, yeah, Kuznets, who is also a Nobel Prize, who raised uh, this, um, this, uh, this puzzle. Uh, also, I'm not sure that Keynes would have made this claim because Keynes was also was only interested in the short run. But uh, but people uh, applied the Keynes uh, idea of, of consumption model of consumption to, to the long run. And so the idea of, of Modigliani is that uh, people optimize their consumption path, uh, that is their consumption now and every year in the future until their death, um, so that. Um, it brings them to the highest uh, intertemporal utility. Um, and so to do that, they, they, they make it smoother because people prefer to have uh, the same income when they retire than uh, before retirement, rather than to have a, uh, yeah, you know, if you don't have a social uh, public um, a pension, uh, you would have zero uh, at retirement. So of course, uh, people may accept a small decrease but, but they would try to smooth and, and have uh, maybe not more than 20% decrease of their income and retirement, something like that. And so uh, people optimize given their amount of wealth and um, their expected incomes. And, um, and uh, yeah. And so um, the theory predicts that people will borrow when they are young because they are poor relatively to when they are 40, well, then they will save and uh, they will dissave at retirement. And the data uh, kind of confirm this uh, life cycle uh, savings pattern, but uh, what we find in data is that uh, old people do not dissave as quickly as predicted by this uh, original model. So now we have a more sophisticated model that uh, can explain this uh, by request motive, you want to uh, leave uh, some capital to your children uh, because uh, you lose some ability when you're old. So uh, even if you've saved uh, beforehand for precaution because you don't know at what age you will die, so you still want to, to keep some capital in case you, you live longer. Uh, you may not be able to consume it because of your ability or, or because you have the habit to, to, to save. Um, but actually, it's, even nowadays, we, we don't. It's hard to distinguish which of these effects uh, drives the the decrease uh, the, the, in uh, in consumption uh, compared to the model. Um, and you have also uh, the Modigliani Miller uh, result. Uh, Miller was another uh, Nobel Prize in finance, and uh, it asked the following question. How should firms raise money? Should they uh, sell bonds or issue stocks? So, uh, do you want to explain what, what is the difference? What is issuing stocks? It's, this is clear for everyone. So, um, so the, 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 the answer for, from this model is that it shouldn't matter because. Um, the, the firm's value uh, lies in the, the, the current wealth of the firm and its future earnings potential. And its level of debt doesn't matter to that. Um, so if the, the firms sell bonds, uh, its level of debt will increase. Um, if uh, it issues stocks, uh, its, its level of debt uh, will, uh, will not uh, increase, but its amount of liabilities will increase because the stock is something you owe to the shareholders. 
So if the shareholder wants to, if all the shareholders agree uh, to, um, to, 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 to buy back their, uh, their shares, then the company will have to, to pay them. Uh, the, the capital of the company will decrease and uh, the money will go in the pocket of the investor. So it shouldn't matter uh, whether the, the company uh, issues debt or stocks. And the ratification is how many dividends uh, should it pay? Also, it doesn't matter because uh, it's the same to pay dividend to a shareholder or to keep the, the cash as unrealized capital gains. Because um, if you pay a dividend and if markets are efficient, which this uh, uh, paper uh, assumes, then the, the stock price uh, of, the, of the shares uh, would decrease by the amount of the dividend. Um, so, uh, so it really doesn't matter. And actually, there are some firms who pay large dividends. Uh, and, and whose stock uh, valuation doesn't grow that much. And there are uh, firms uh, whose stock uh, rise uh, year after year because they don't pay dividends. Uh, of course, this theorem is a simplification of reality and there are departures from, from this idealized uh, situation in the real world. Uh, okay, now I'll talk about uh, econometric modeling. Um, so econometrics, uh, was founded by uh, Jan Timbergen and, uh, and Ragnar Pech. Uh, the first is Dutch and the second is uh, Norwegian. And, um, and the, the idea of econometrics is to merge uh, math, economics, and statistics. Because uh, econometricians like uh, Ragnar Pech, they criticize that uh, with qualitative models, uh, you, could, you, you could make uh, the model say pretty much whatever you like. Whereas when, when you constrain your model with, with, with equations so that it's internally consistent and with data so that it's externally uh, valid or proven, uh, disproved, by, uh, then uh, you really make, you really, uh, make science. And uh, they had a very strong influence on economics in the 1940s only 3% of pages in the American Economic Review, which is one of the leading journals in economics, contain math. And nowadays, it's 40% of pages uh, that contain equations. And um, this is, um, by the way, uh, a battle that uh, Keynes lost, because uh, Keynes thought, was, was skeptical that uh, we could put society into equations. Uh, because for Keynes, uh, there is um, um, some um, difference between probabilities and that are what we call risk and uncertainty. Uncertainty is when you don't know the probabilities. And in the real world, you don't know the probabilities. You don't know whether tomorrow uh, the stock market will increase or decrease. Uh, you can try to put probability on it, but uh, according to Keynes, it will give us a false sense of certainty. And according to him, um, econometric models make simplifying assumptions like linearity, like uh, take, taking their, their equation as, 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 as good, uh, their, their specification as the good one, uh, thinking there is no omitted variable in their model. Um, assumptions of uh, normality of the error terms, so things like that. Um, that, um, that cannot actually represent uh, the world and can lead to uh, misleadingly think we have uh, the answer, although we, we don't have it. And, um, and so people like Keynes uh, uh, criticized uh, Tim Bergen where, when he built the, the first national and uh, statistic, statistically tested uh, macroeconomic model uh, for the Netherlands, then he did the same for the US. Uh, Keynes commented on it. He said, "Why? Well, it's, it's an amazing work. You, we saw you, you worked a lot, but uh, but in your model, everything is deterministic. There is no room for uh, uh, expectation. If people are optimistic or pessimistic, it will have influences on, on the economy, and this you cannot see in your model. Um, and uh, and here, uh, Keynes is, is not just saying that because he's bad in math. Actually, he wrote a book that is called The Treatise on Probability." 
uh, it was really a, a epistemological uh, uh, idea. Um, now, uh, it's, it's the other camp that, win, that won the battle. Uh, we, we want to, because qualitative economics also has uh, its efficiencies, of course, because uh, we cannot, uh, if we don't test the theory with data, we cannot know which theory is right. And uh, it's true that uh, writing uh, uh, theories with, uh, uh, with the mathematical formalization helps uh, see the see uh, yeah see what it really means uh, have have an, un an ambiguous theory. So yeah, a few words on, on, on these uh, first econometricians. So Tim Bergen, um, he was a social democrat, so he was seeking for an optimal social order. Uh, he's known for advocating a five to one ratio in income. So no, no any income should be five times higher than the lowest income. And it's remembered for a Tim Bergen rule, uh, which says that to achieve uh, end targets, let's say two targets, full employment and uh, equality, you should have at least uh, end instruments. So in this case, uh, for example, double activation and redistributive taxes. Uh, now, Ragnar Fisch uh, founded uh, Econometrics, uh, the Econometric Society, which is uh, institution that uh, an association that uh, publishes Econometrica, uh, for which he was the, the first editor in the, the first 20 years of Econometrica. Um, it's, a, it's a very powerful position uh, in economics to, to, to be editor of one of the five uh, top five journal like Econometrica. Um, because uh, by accepting or rejecting, by accepting a paper, you, you you, you, you really uh, um, improve the career of, uh, of the author uh, and help uh, the person find a good position um, and, and make the, their work visible. So right now, Frisch worked on time series, innovation, and introduced the impulse response function that maybe some of you have seen in macro, but uh, I will not uh, discuss it. Um, then an important one was Lawrence Klein, who, um, in a pragmatic way, built uh, models of the U.S. economy. Uh, at, this, at the beginning, his model had uh, 15 equations, 55, then he extended it, extended it, extended it, and in 83, it had uh, more than a thousand equations. So it's a model that uh, uh, is sectoral and, and uh, look at what happens in each sector of the economy, how these are interrelated, and even later, uh, he extended uh, his program of research to have a model that, uh, that combines models of all countries in the world and to have a one big uh, model of the, of the global economy. And uh, he estimated, uh, he adjusted the, the equations pragmatically so that it fits the data and uh, used uh, the, the best uh, available techniques at the time to estimate the, the model, uh, limited information, maximum likelihood. He also had uh, theoretical contributions um, first, he wanted to, to test whether uh, classical economics or, or Keynes was right. But his test was not very convincing, although he said it was Keynes. And uh, he had a simple ex explanation as to uh, why there is unemployment. Maybe that the, the natural rate of interest that that um, equalizes uh, investment and saving is negative. And uh, as we cannot have negative interest uh, rates in practice because uh, because people can still can we prefer to to keep their cash rather than to lend it at a negative rate? Um, we we have a, we have a problem. The last one is a uh, Finnish Trigve Avelmo, and uh, maybe it's <laughs> it's a sign that I should finish uh, there. And uh, and so yeah, his um, dissertation, special dissertation, convinced economists to use probability theory. Uh, where, uh, yeah, which was not evident at the time. And uh, he's also known for uh, the balanced budget multiplier, which is uh, a policy he promoted, where um, it's a, basically a progressive tax that leaves the public deficit uh, intact. Uh, that's why it's called balanced budget. And uh, why multiplier? Because by taking to the rich who have a low propensity to consume and giving to the poor who have a high propensity to consume, you increase uh, consumption, hence uh, investment, hence the uh, level of activity, uh, according to Keynesian theory. 
Yeah, thank you very much.